Welcome. We are so excited to have you join us here this afternoon. I am Dr. Karen Pearson. I chair FIT's Sustainability Council, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today as we kick off Sustainability Awareness Week 2023 at the Fashion Institute of Technology. This marks the 10th year of hosting a week of programming that celebrates and engages our community in learning around the pillars of sustainability. As we begin our programming this week, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the ancestral homelands of the indigenous peoples of this area, the munsi speaking Lenape, Leni Lenape. We invite you to join us in paying respect to the generations of people who were forcibly displaced from this area. We recognize their continued connection to these lands and waterways and commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Please join us in this commitment. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Joyce F. Brown, President of the Fashion Institute of Technology, to share her welcome and highlight the institution's commitment to the key pillars of sustainability. Well, good afternoon and thank you to Karen. Welcome to everyone who's joined us this afternoon. As Karen said, I'm Dr. Joyce Brown. I'm the president of FIT and I am really very, very pleased to be able to welcome you to the opening of our Sustainability Awareness Week. You know, each year, Sustainability Awareness Week explores the pillars of sustainability. They're human, social, economic, and environmental. And it challenges our community to reinforce and to expand our advocacy for preserving our planet. Now this is a very special year because we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of Sustainability Awareness Week here on the FIT campus, which really showcases the long-term commitment of our community to this very, very important topic. Sustainability is really integral to life at FIT, and as I remind us every year, that is especially because we are aware of the continuing adverse impact that the practices of the fashion industry have had on our environment. So sustainability is key to our mission at FIT and a major part of our institutional strategic plan. We know that by infusing sustainability into our academic curricula across all schools and programs, we can produce the next generation of industry leaders inculcated with the understanding and belief that protecting the environment is good for business as well as good for the earth. So during Sustainability Awareness Week, you will see firsthand the passion and commitment that our community has for sustainability. It should really give us all hope for future generations and for an enlightened industry through its practices. This week's activities and programs encompass not only presentations from sustainability champions and corporate partners, but also from our own students and faculty and staff who have been engaged in exploring innovative alternatives to everyday and scientific practices through their projects and their research. So as we celebrate the accomplishments of our FIT students, faculty, and alumni as sustainability activists, there are many interactive events this week. You'll be able to learn about our natural dye garden and our green roofs, how to mend and repurpose apparel and accessories, and even repurposing sustainable flowers. And new this year is the opportunity to take a curated tour of the museum at FIT's latest exhibition, which is Food and Fashion with a Sustainability Focus. The week offers many options to experience workshops and panels and speeches and presentations, and I hope you'll be able to attend many, if not most, of these events. Now in a moment, as part of our Faces and Places series, we will welcome a discussion called Launching a Clean Company from Beauty to Apparel. But before I turn this podium back over to Dr. Karen Pearson, our chair of the Sustainability Council, I want to take a moment to welcome another new face to our campus. Carter Strickland 
is SUNY's recently appointed and first ever Chief Sustainability Officer, and he's the Executive Director of Climate Action for SUNY. So we're very pleased to have you. I hope all of you will have an opportunity to meet Mr. Strickland. Um, and we're looking forward to partnering with you on the system-wide commitment to sustainability. And so we're very grateful and thank you for joining us. Without further ado, I am going to turn this back over to Karen Pearson. So enjoy the rest of the activities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for both your remarks and your unwavering commitment to the pillars of sustainability. As we welcome you to Sustainability Awareness Week 2023, we hope that you will take inspiration from our speakers in the events this week. The programming is part of FIT's commit, continued commitment to sustainability. This is designed to be a platform for sharing ideas and the collective work that is needed to continue to push for change. These will share innovation, new models, and all of this focuses on our global sustainable, global effort for sustainability. On behalf of the Sustainability Council, I want to extend a special welcome to our alumni. It is so wonderful to have you back here on campus. We also want to take an opportunity to welcome SUNY's Chief Sustainability Officer and Executive Director of Climate Action, Carter Strickland. And before we launch today's program, I would like to take just a moment to acknowledge the commitment to sustainability you see here is a result of partnerships and collaborations both within the FIT community and with our external partners. These collaborations really allow us to excel, and we've seen so much growth and expansion as we have continued to foster these partnerships. This collective goal is leading us to a pathway for a more sustainable future for the fashion industries. One example of these, this partnership is our partnership with Bloomingdale's that has led to enhanced support of our GenSpace Scholars Program, as well as opportunities centered around learning and service at our FIT's Dye Garden. Continued growth of collaborative initiatives and discussions are imperative to continue to push the needle towards change. We hope that you will continue to support this effort with contributions to FIT's Sustainability Fund and with your attendance at our 18th annual, yes, 18th annual Sustainable Business and Design Conference Reimagining Our Future, which will be held April 9th and 10th of 2024. Before we get started, a special thanks must go out to all of the council members who have contributed and offered leadership to help make this week possible, as well as our partnership partners across the college, including the FIT Foundation. It is now my great pleasure to welcome Caroline Gordon to the stage. Caroline will moderate the discussion with Chrissy Kaler, co-founder of Four Days on building a sustainable company from all facets, from defining her company's mission statement to choosing sustainable partnerships. And with that, Caroline, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce her. She has been an adjunct faculty member at FIT since 2018, teaching in both the schools of business and technology and art and design. She recently joined the FIT's Sustainability Council. However, she has been partnering with us for many years. Caroline has worked in the fashion industry in New York City for 18 years across multiple brands, including Ralph Lauren, Ann Taylor, and Hill House Home. She has experience in women's wear and children's wear with a focus on buying, planning, and wholesales. In addition to teaching at FIT, Caroline runs a consulting company helping small and sustainable companies launch their business at wholesale. She is also a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and an active member of the Wharton J. H. Baker Retail Initiative. Caroline. Hi, 
everyone. It is so great to kick off this Sustainability Awareness Week. And our guest today, Christy Kaler, is an, a phenomenal founder of a company that we all aspire uh, to, to mimic um, as a sustainable mission. Christy Kaler is an entrepreneur and sustainability visionary. She brings a unique understanding of the circular economy to Four Days, a company she founded with a mission to keep textiles out of landfills. Four Days rewards consumers for recycling their used textiles in any condition through the company's Take Back Bag program and helps them spend those rewards on sustainable products. Before founding Four Days, Christy co-founded Mayette, one of the first ethically driven luxury retailers. As president, she sourced, built, and oversaw a network of artisans across 14 countries. Christy launched Mayette on the Paris runway, opened a store in New York Soho neighborhood, and sold the collection to major retailers including Barney's, Bergdorf Goodman, Neiman Marcus, and Saks. Prior to Mayette, Christy spent her early career launching and growing businesses for Gap Inc., including Banana Republic Petites and Banana Republic Japan. She is also, was also instrumental in leading Gap's product, Red Division. Kaler's efforts and accomplishments have earned her great accolades over the years. She has been recognized among the Voss Foundation's Women Helping Women Honoree in 2014, the Glossy 50 Fashion Digital Front Runners in 2018, and Entrepreneurs 100 Women of Influence in 2022. Under her influence leadership, Four Days was also named as one of Fast Company's brands that matter in 2022. Outside of Four Days, Christy hones her passion for fashion, sustainability, and innovation as a member of the CFDA. She also worked on the UN Foundation, the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Consumerism, the Lexus Fashion Initiative Advisory Board, Cradle to Cradle's Fashion Plus, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's Textile Initiative. Christy holds an MBA from the University of Southern California and a BS in Industrial Engineering with a minor in Fine Arts of Painting from Northwestern University. Please join me in welcoming Christy. Thank you for joining us at FIT today. Oh, thank you for having me. So, so happy to be. Uh, so I think I want to just start off by talking about your career before you decided to found your two companies that you've, you've worked on that with a sustainable mission. Sure, yeah. You had mentioned I um, was really actually very fortunate to take a quite entrepreneurial position within Gap Inc. Um, right out of business school. And it was great. I've always been kind of a questioner of the status quo. And so when you're launching and growing new businesses, you think about new markets, new customers. Um, and, and I got kind of exposed to every facet of the business. So whether it was design, merchandising, planning, real estate, uh, production, and for me being actually an industrial engineer by training, connecting those dots and from a systems approach was really, really important. And as I kind of continued throughout my career there, I got exposure to bigger and bus bigger businesses, and therefore that meant kind of bigger and bigger quantities of product. And yeah. um, while living in Japan, I was spending a lot of time in our supply chain which was actually quite unusual to be able to do when you're sitting in like the corporate office, but because I was relatively local. And I think it was, it was actually then that I saw just the sheer magnitude, literally on the ground, of the impact that we have as an industry wow. on people on the planet. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when, that's when you decided you wanted to do your sustainable mission. How did you come about kind of getting the... Yeah, it was really then it. that I just was like, wait, this doesn't make sense. Like yeah. It was actually more of a like, if we do it this way for forever, how are we ever going to improve Survive. the business model? <laughs> yeah, and and when you think about it, when you're buying millions of units for a company like Gap, you're, you're buying so many, you have these huge margins so that you can mark it down. You end up just by default, the pure like math equation tells you you're going to end up with a ton left over. Where does that go? And it started to kind of dawn on me that like unless we change the way we do business and the way we engage the supply chain, the way we think about production and planning and pricing, it was never going to change. Like this was a model that actually works and it still works today. Yeah. Like that's what we all know. Yeah. And so it was really then that I was like, I need to impact this differently. And 
I first took over Product Thread uh, for Gap because it was really the only thing I could get my hands on. Uh -huh. I was like, wait, we have to improve the world with fashion. And people were like, what are you talking about? We just make things. Yeah. I was like, well, we've got to be able to do something. And Can you remind the audience about yeah. what Product Red? Yeah, so yeah. Product Red was really, in so many ways, like a first of its kind. Um, it was the brainchild of Bono and Bobby Shriver, so like great people behind it. Um, yeah. And the idea was that our dollars matter. And so, you know, what we buy actually can impact and change the world. And that was really novel at that point. Um, and so, you know, their passion and cause was um, the AIDS epidemic in Africa. And they were like, great, if we can engage these, like, huge consumer brands in making products that could contribute to um, the work being done in Africa, that would be very monumental. And so they partnered with brands like Gap and Converse and Starbucks and said, great, these products will, a portion will will help the cause of AIDS in Africa. And it was very powerful. Um, it was done in unison. We had these huge celebrities behind it. You know, when it's on Oprah, it helps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and that worked. But we made t-shirts and, and really tried to help that way by selling them at volume. Uh, but it's an interesting business model when you think about true sustainable change, not just like sustainable for the planet, because it was actually a profit donation model. Mm. And so when you're taking a business and you're saying, well, we're going to take half of your profits, which aren't that big in the first place in this industry, and just donate them, it's not, it's not a sustainable growth model. And so for me, that was the moment that I was like, I think like business model innovation is actually where we need to focus. That makes sense. Yeah. So what did you do next? How did you get started? Yeah, so I, le I left Gap um, after running some pretty huge businesses, and I kind of started dabbling a little bit while I was thinking about leaving and got involved with some groups working out of Guatemala with artisans and and spent time on the ground really trying to think like, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could employ, and this was leading into my up, wouldn't it be great if you could employ people in places that needed at, like employment, access to markets, they had these beautiful crafts, like how hard would that be? Turns out it's really hard, <laughs> but, um, but still it's, it's, it's possible. And so um, what I saw as a big gap in the luxury market uh, is where we kind of built Mayet, um, because I felt like that consumer base was actually starting to kind of pay attention because just by nature of artisanship, you know, the stories were being told, like this beautiful leather handbag made in Italy. People are like, oh, mate, that's cool. Yeah. So it seemed like a, a space we could kind of build into. Yeah, and so I think too at the time, and I don't know if this has changed actually as dramatically as those of us in the industry probably, or in the topic of sustainability probably think, but, in 2010, um, when we were starting my people were like, oh, you're going to make a sustainable fashion brand? That's cute. Is it going to be sold in Whole Foods? You know, and you're like, no, it's going to be sold at Barney's, guys. And, and nobody believed us. <laughs> like, everybody like, that can't be done. Um, and I think that idea of, like, really bringing products and services to market that satisfy and please people on their merits alone um, is still something that's very, very important. And so that's really our strategic positioning of Mayette was to say, okay, it's like Celine or Mayette, like you choose. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. One is really pretty and everyone knows you paid a lot for it and yeah. the other one actually helps yeah. people on the other But it's equally world. pretty and yeah. you ended up paying just as much for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, it, it was changing the world. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, and how did you find the artisans that would create the goods that you bring in? From, from a lot that? of travel. I mean, it's triangulating in. I think that kind of holds true for anything that you're doing often in sustainability is it hasn't really, really been done before. And so I would say, like, you know, the curiosity level has to be incredibly high to kind yeah. of figure these things out. So we spent a lot of time developing the supply chain, bringing it together, um, you know, putting obviously a lot of intention around design and quality and then presenting it, uh, you know, in, in the traditional landscape. I think um, it was through that experience and as we were growing the brand and I, I thought, you know, we were so pioneering in what we were doing, but I found myself in this conversation around sustainability consistently because we were early to the conversation. What I realized as much as making a beautiful product more sustainably was great, the whole system actually had that same problem that I had seen at Gap. And yeah. so even though we were in luxury, where I thought it would be more thoughtful, I mean, Neiman's would order twice as much as they needed and then send half of it back to me. And what was I going to do? Like, right. charge my artisans back? Right. So, no. 
Yeah. Um, and so I think it was then really like the light bulb moments of saying, okay, the, the way that we produce and purchase and don't take responsibility for things yeah. is a problem. Yeah. Big picture, like yeah. everywhere. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Which then birthed yeah. the idea for four days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it did. It was, I sat on um, this cradle to cradle fashion positive leadership team. All these titles have so yeah. many words. That they, every time I hear them out loud, I'm like, couldn't they come up with catchier names? Um, but it was, it was great. I started learning about circularity and I was like, oh, this whole concept seems really smart. Like, why are we taking raw materials, putting so much time and energy into z designing beautiful products? getting them to market, selling them, and then throwing them out. Yeah. Like, why are, what, why are we, do, that seems crazy. Why right. are we doing this? And I think cradle to cradle kind of really educated people, even before Ellen MacArthur, on like the full idea of regeneration. Yeah. And so for me, I started looking at the market as a whole and tapping back into where I started and was like, you know, I can see a world where luxury is resold and we can extend life, but like the rest, what are we gonna do there? Right. And that seems like the biggest problem and that's when I started doing some work with the World Economic Forum, Global Future Council on Consumerism, again, a mouthful. Um, but it was cool because I was sitting with like the chief economist from Visa and somebody senior from H&M and Alibaba and Rakuten. And you realize that like shifting the business model from their kind of perch is going to be almost impossible. Yeah. So it had to come from innovation. It had to come from entrepreneurs. And if we could create a business model that actually drove circular behavior, that could be transformative. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So um, I, I'm sure most people in the audience are really aware of what you do at Four Days, but you want to explain a little bit how the take back bag works? Yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of times I get asked, like, when we talk about circularity, I also think most people, like, some people know what circular economy is. I was just at a founder's event um, in New York, and I was like, I work in circular economy. People are like, circular what? <laughs> and I'm like, I know. <laughs> anyway, so we were really built with this foundational principle that if you can recapture and regenerate, you can make a very significant impact on waste reduction and raw material usage. And we started um, actually by making products, really beautiful sustainable circular products and thought that would be the way that people could engage with circularity. Your t-shirt wears out, you can send it back to us, you get another one, it wears out. And that was working, but when we started talking to customers, we realized that everybody had so much stuff. Um, if I could see you all a little better, I would ask this question, who here has too much stuff? <laughs> Pretty much everybody, yeah. Everybody had so much stuff. And we started talking to people and they were like, oh, I've got this pile. And it was this like problem where it was like, single socks and stretched out pajamas and like, um, and we said, well, what if we could take care of that? Would that like help you? Yes, please yeah. help me. Yeah. And so we developed this thing called the take back bag where we allowed uh, customers to fill it up with anything from any brand in any condition. It's important because I think when when businesses come out and say, could you please separate out your like white dark denim from your light denim and maybe your silk and wool, but only if it's cashmere, you're like, oh. I'm not gonna do that. Right. And so people don't do it. So the take back bag is a really simple way to recycle your clothes. Customers buy it from us, um, send us everything, and then we reward them uh, with what we call closet cash. And so it's really a way to kind of drive value, but do the right thing. Yeah, that's great. I, I feel like it's a real problem for people who really want to be sustainable and don't know what to do with that last pile of stained single socks. You know, there's no home for that. And, yeah. and that's what's going in the landfill on top of you know, you, there are a lot of things that maybe you can resell or you can pass along to someone or, you know, donate. But if you can't do that, you're just throwing it away. And so this is, yeah, this and is it's, a big solution. It is, and it's, it's even for the people who actually just don't want to go through the bother of donating or separating things. And I think yes. that's important because when we think about sustainable solutions, we also think about, like, for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think those of us who are mindful, which how the company actually came to be. I was moving from Manhattan to Brooklyn and I was doing exactly that. I was yeah. like, okay, what can I take to the donation? What can I give to this person? What could I sell here? And I was still left with a pile of crap. And I was like, but the days it took me to even get there, most people don't do. Yeah. And so I think, you know, when we're thinking about solutions, we think about easy, like how easy, maximum adoption, most yeah. people. Yeah. And that's what's happened with the take back bag. It's actually just become this like, phenomenon. It's yeah. wild. That's yeah. great. So what do you do with it when you get the bags? 
Yeah, so, well, when we started, we uh, took everything back in our warehouse in California, and that was a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, we were so overwhelmed with stuff. We had to keep renting, like, huge containers. <laughs> sort of. We couldn't process it fast enough. Um, and so we now have a facility in Texas. It's 300,000 square feet. Wow. Um, and we are, like, the best matchmaking service for used clothes in the world is how I like to say it because <laughs> everything comes through it's sorted and graded um, using a pretty sophisticated sorting and grading process uh, we end up with everything going into one of 250 buckets basically and that bucket has a destination and so that de destination can be reuse it can be downcycling it can be fiber to fiber recycling very dependent on what the product is what the quality is what the category is what the seasonality is what the material is so we do all that hard work. Okay. And 95% um, of it stays out of landfill. That's and great. finds a next, yeah. next home yeah. for however many years. Hopefully many years. <laughs> and what do you do with the reuse pile? Do you donate it or do you actually try to? No, we find markets for it. Um, you know, there's a lot, I think, the used clothing market can be complicated and it can be destructive as much as it can be helpful. So you have to yeah. do it responsibly. Um, you know, I think in contrast to the way we do it, a lot of people, like even those corner bins, you know, you see, a lot of those companies will take that product and just bail it all together and ship it offshore. Oh. And so if you think about like the person who put the coffee cup or the baby diaper, like all that goes with it. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about like offshoring trash, like that's what produces that problem. Got it. Um, so for us, I think that the level of detail in getting the sort right, but that means that we end up with like really specific categories. So it can be like summer cotton baby clothes. Yeah. And we can find somebody who wants to buy those. Yeah. Um, like I love the story of uh, one buyer who buys actually really, really low quality t-shirts, which are like, eh, that's weird. But actually it's to clothe farm workers who are in the sun all day. Oh. So they want to pay very little. Yeah. But they need, they wear them until they're threads. Yeah. And so, you know, every... Every uh, garment has a home somewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. And so you and Four Days has also grown with other models. I'm not sure which one's your biggest model. If if yeah. the recycling is the biggest part of your, um, you know, your bottom line, or I know you do some marketplace. Yeah, well, so the two things work together. So basically, you recycle, you get um, basically get your money back in the form of a reward, and we work with brands to help drive customers to better products. So using your closet cash on more sustainable products. Um, and that can be cross vertical. It doesn't have to just be fashion. So home, uh, we do, we're even bringing in like food products and more lifestyle products and just trying to help customers direct um, their choices in better ways. And then we work with big brands on offering take back bags to their customers. And the idea that this can be just a very kind of common and universal way to recycle clothes. That's great. Yeah, love it. Um, how, do you go through a vetting process with the partners that you work with, your, your retail partners? Uh, yes. Um, retail partners, we look at kind of key characteristics. So, you know, who, how do you run your business on very basic levels just for, through the sustainability lens? Uh, we look at whether it's sustainable materials, whether it's business model innovation, whether it's minority owned and representation, just different facets um, for how we can at least identify good partners. Um, you know, it's not a perfect science. Yeah. As we all know. Yeah. 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 Um, are there any specific hardships that you found in this space? Other, I mean, you've touched on a couple, but some that you feel like if you're th out there and you're thinking of launching a sustainable company, you know, you should really be aware of this. Oh gosh. Unique problem. I mean, <laughs> how long do you guys have? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, anytime you're really doing something new, you're doing it for the first time. And so what's tough is like there's no blueprint and you're trying to figure it out so it can feel very confusing. Um, that's totally natural. I think just keep going is, is kind of the answer. I think for us, um, you know, we came to the market with four days with an idea of a business model and it actually wasn't the right one. And so we had to get very kind of close to the consumer and say, what, what would be the right one? What do you think? Um, knowing that there was something there, you know, that there was definitely an opportunity. I think um, 
there's kind of two sides to the equation that we think about and the upstream supply chain is one. Um, that's where I used to focus in my prior life more. Now we have built kind of this whole post-consumer reverse supply chain that, that really didn't exist. And so thinking about asking people to send you everything back, most people are like, no, it's one direction, please. Yeah. Um, and so just even figuring out tracking and traceability and you know what the technology layer for that looks like is, is brand new. Um, so there's always a lot of new, <laughs> a lot of problems to solve. Um, but I don't know. I think from our perspective, it's like keep the customer like really central mm -hmm. and figure out, provide something that people want and need and uh, is of value, not just for the sake of it being cool, yeah. um, is really important. That's great. Um, so you went back and got your MBA at USC. Were you, did you work in the industry before you went back? No, I went back pretty early. I actually did a startup right out of undergrad, um, more in the tech space. You can see I'm like, it's it's a problem. It's an affliction starting companies. Um, and I did that, and I realized I didn't know what I was doing, and I wanted to get a better foundation. So uh, did business school pretty young, like pretty soon after undergrad. And um, yeah, it, it was it was great. I mean, it's put me in a situation where like I can talk about financial statements as well as our CFO. So, you know, you do it for personal specific skill sets that you're seeking, but um, for me, it was, it was, it's been very helpful. Yeah, that's great. So for students in the room that are think, considering maybe going for that second step, um, what do you, what did you learn in the program that you felt like was so useful. I mean, obviously, yeah, some I, mean, I think everybody's so different. Like, I really, you guys could probably tell just by my intro, I like school. Like, I've <laughs> done a good amount of it. Um, so for me, it's a great way to, to learn and really kind of feel like I have a skill set that I can use. Um, you know, grad school can, I, in my opinion, everybody's different. Like, I wouldn't do it just for the kind of letters behind your name. Like, yeah. that's not why. For me, it was like at an early stage, I learned a lot. I've put it to use. Mm -hmm. um, I always think about education through that lens. Like, what can you learn and utilize? Yeah. And is it going to be functional? Because otherwise, it's just really expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so, obviously, you worked for some pretty large corporations in the past. What do you think can be done to turn these behemoths? Now, now especially knowing what you know, yeah. you know 10, 15 years out. I mean, I, I really, and this is where, you know, innovation's so important. I think many of the solutions that these companies need, whether it's materials or technology or what we do, which is like really in the business model or, or you know, cool reverse logistics, it's gonna come from startups. And, and I think um, some big companies are good at incubating a few ideas, but often it's really that external innovation and I think the best ones lean into that and try things and test things and they don't always get it right and that's okay yeah um, and I think you know as as we look at the landscape they're kind of the businesses that are still afraid yeah and they don't do much and then the businesses that are trying and they're not perfect none of them are yeah I always say, well, if they're trying, that's, yeah. a, that's a good step. It's half, half of that. Yeah, exactly. Just trying. And so we have some alumni in the room, or we have students who are about to graduate and maybe go work for some of these corporations. Mm -hmm. What do you think the average industry professional can do to just, at their post, make a slight difference? Yeah, I mean, I think in any position, like, there's kind of this, this process, like, learn as much as you can, ask questions, read, go to things, listen to podcasts, learn. I, maybe annoyingly so, was always not afraid to just ask questions and pose the challenge internally. Um, there's usually a group of people who are similarly kind of interested um, in figuring something out. Uh, you know, I think just be, be curious is always be curious, be vocal, um, and find your people because there's usually some folks out there who are like, yeah, I'm thinking about that too, or oh, I saw that too, or you know, I think that be you can be kind of a voice. And then you can also be an advocate for trying new things. Like we talk a lot to people who are in sustainability roles or marketing roles or merchandising roles or, you know, we were talking about market opportunities. It's like in those roles, you have an opportunity to bring new ideas to the table. Yeah. Like just, um, yeah. If you don't voice them, you'll never know. Yeah. Yeah. Be an advocate for, for <laughs> trying things out. I guess I also ask the same question for all of us in the room that are consumers. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's some baby steps that we should all be embracing? 
Yeah, it's it's not dissimilar advice where it's like we're never I, it's going to be hard to make everything perfect. And I feel like then we get into this like paralysis stage where I don't know what to choose. And it's kind of like don't be afraid to make a mistake, just make a choice, try new things, try things on for size. Um, you know, they're new kind of programs and products and services out there all the time. Most people will give you a month free because they're really desperate. For, you know, try things. Um, I think it's a little bit like finding your exercise routine. Like yeah. find what works for you. Yeah. And just do that and keep doing that. You don't have to do it all. Right. Right. A little bit goes a long way. Keeping your product in life, your product in use for a little longer yeah. can actually go a really long way. Yeah, I mean, if you extend the life, four more times. Yeah, yeah, one more time. I think it's yeah. like four more times than the average, and you're, you know, reducing raw material usage and greenhouse gas emissions by sixty percent. It's really, definitely being thoughtful about. I, my number one advice is always just be thoughtful at the point of purchase. Like, do I really want this? Do I know how it's made? Can I use it for a long time? And if no, like, do I need it? What is this for? It's yeah. kind of like an emotional question at that yeah. point. But I think um, that, you know, our dollars, going back to like my very first experience, like our dollars really matter. And if you put them in the right place, like that moves markets. Yeah. And again, you don't have to spend necessarily more money. Like try and find what works for you, but think about it at that exchange moment. Yeah. It's a very powerful tool we have, our, yeah. our money. Got to teach my kids this message because I know I'm pretty sure 90 percent of what they want me to buy they do not need. Oh my gosh! Right? <laughs> and we'll be in the garbage in two days. Exactly. Um, so, do you do you have any um, companies that you think are doing an A plus job that you kind of marvel at or you know recommend uh, to the room? Other yeah, than I mean, I, I live and breathe the the fashion industry, so I I really look outside of what we do for cool things. I get really excited when I'm in a room of people. I you know, have never heard from before. And I'm like, what are you up to? I was just actually at a Climate Week event and um, there was an amazing company called Cruise Foam and they make basically a styrofoam replacement out of what is the equivalent of like uh, shrimp shells. Sounds wow. crazy, right? But they're yeah. doing it at like pretty great scale. And wow. so if you think about like that's using bio waste to make a material that's traditionally incredibly toxic and terrible for the world that we all have in our life on a daily basis, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so those material science kind of stories, yeah. I just can nerd out on and I like. Um, there was another company called Tulu, T-U-L-U. -U. Uh, and it's, again, just amazing entrepreneurs. And they've created um, kiosks in the bottom of large uh, rental buildings. So, you know, like apartment complexes uh -huh. where you can go and rent the things you don't want to buy. So like, you know, a screwdriver or random stuff that you don't ever need more than once. And I'm oh, like, wow. oh, smart, durable goods, sharing economy, like it's yeah. the right place for it. You know, just, oh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Smart thing. Has anyone seen one of those? They have a bunch of buildings, oh. I think in Stanford. I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So cool stuff like that. Keep our eyes peeled. Cause I'm sure yeah. that New York City smart people, yeah, solving problems, that. exactly. Um, or universities, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. <laughs> Think about all those things you don't need all the time. Yeah. Um, being someone who has hired a number of people over the years, both in sustainable companies and not so sustainable companies, what do you think that FIT can be doing to better prepare our, our graduates? Oh gosh, I mean, I don't know everything you guys do, so I don't want to say do better. Um, I don't know. I think the programs that you guys have and just the awareness and like bringing a week like this to the forefront, making it, um, I think historically, and this applies to almost every channel business, sustainability was this other thing. So it's like, here's our business, and then we have sustainability over here. That can't be the answer. Mm -hmm. Like it actually has to be the thing yeah. because the system has to work together. Right. And so if we make it this add on, this bolt on, an afterthought, a specialty, um, you know, I think the best thing we can do is get everybody thinking in this mindset all the time. And then we're all rowing in the same direction. And those little incremental changes that can happen at every touch point add up to a ton. And then we're all in the same kind of mindset. Um, I think that's just for change as a whole yeah like it's not it has to be sustainable business model like it's the whole thing yeah yeah, yeah. there has to be thought 
yeah. in, in the whole well, process. Well, in collective thought, not just isolated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the hardest pills to swallow in this industry is that uh, we're all addicted to that bottom line and the growth and, and hitting numbers and making profit higher and higher. How do you um, kind of grapple with that and also, you know, running a profitable business or a business that yep. can survive? Yep. And yep. Being part of the sustainability part. Yeah, exactly. It's like you have to be financially sustainable. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I th I think the piece that I grapple with the most is like the just the cons the consumer pattern of things, which is what you talked about before, which is just like more, more, more is what drives money, money, money. Yeah. And I'm like, but we're not really going to stop that as long as there's like a four dollar bikini and a seven dollar dress that's pretty cute. You know, like yeah. people are still going to buy this. So how do we how do we think about economics through not just the bottom line, but basically new behaviors or new relationships? And so. We've always thought through our business model specifically as can we better people, the planet, and the profit? Like, is there a way to do that? Because if you could do that, wouldn't that would just be great? Um, and so in our model is implicit this retention mechanism. So people recycle, they earn, and they spend, but then they recycle, earn, and spend again. Yeah. And so we're driving this incredible retention, which is driving LTV, which is driving, you know, the kind of appetite for other brands to get on board and it's starting to speak their business language. Yeah. Um, so it's not perfect, but it's like, okay, because there's an embedded recycle step in all of that, like at least we're capturing and eliminating the waste. Yeah. Um, but I think without profit mechanisms or at least a path to that, it's a really tough sell. Yeah. So I think that always has to be part of it. Again, if I could f figure out how to not have to make so much new stuff Mm -hmm. To have everybody make a bunch of money, that would be cool, but I yeah. think we're far off from that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and y is your company mostly making money off of your marketplace, or are you actually making money off of any of the resale that you're doing? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of complicated but clear margin at every step model. Yeah. It's just not huge margins off of any one thing. So we make um, some margin on the take back bag, kind of sales and processing. And then customers come back and, and buy, and we'll take portions of those transactions as well. And yeah. so it is still predicated on people coming and consuming. Yeah. Um, ideally, better things. Uh -huh. And again, the whole behavior of not putting stuff in the trash is is actually, if we can do that at scale repeatedly, like that's that's the impact we can drive. I think that's the other thing on that, like what can you do to be more sustainable? Sometimes you just have to choose your thing. Uh -huh. yeah, like you can't do all the things. Right. Choose the one you're going to work on. And so we've kind of honed in on this like collection, waste diversion, recycling. Let's keep things out of the trash. Yeah. Um, that's our thing. That's great. Yeah. Uh, how many different partners are you working with that are also using your take bag take back facility and using putting their logo on the bag but sending it back yeah in what's interesting is we actually don't just private label this and that was an intentional business decision because our customers have come to trust us mm. and so we always we can co-brand but we never white label um and it was a big strategic decision because i was like no because it stops with us like they need to know who's doing this right and, and trust we, that it's not just a lie and hold us accountable yeah you know it's like i want people to be able to call us or email us and be like hey where did it go yeah. And once you pass that on, I think things get foggy, foggy. But anyway, so we have about 20 partners working with us um, of all like, shapes and sizes. Can you, any feel like you can share with us? Well, uh, one of our first partners, so I can definitely share it, um, Bombas, the oh, sock wow. company. Yeah. So we, we launched with them about a year ago. That's great. Uh, we sold 1,000 bags in the first week wow. without advertising. Wow. So it's really incredible what this product can do. Yeah. And it's been great. We doubled their retention in 90 days from the group of people who bought our bags. So, again, that's the business model and practice. And, um, you know, we, we pass off the savings. So, like, anything we collect, we track and trace the impact, pounds, water, carbon, and we pass that back to our partner. And so that's if great. you think about it from their side, they're like, wait, instantaneous savings. <laughs> this yeah. is great. And that's the goal. It's like yeah. make it easy for everyone. That's great. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions from our class that we've developed on the first day that we're asking all of our guests Great. every week. Um, and the first is, looking back on your journey, what do you think is the most important decision you've made in your career and why? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the most important decision I made in my career was probably at the very beginning when I started 
at SCAP, I really was vocal about questioning things and trying to find my way into the conversations that interested me. And that wasn't always traditional, like there's particularly in big corporate where it's like, you know, keep your head down, make sure everybody looks good doing their job and you'll get promoted. Yeah. And I was like kind of noisy. Um, but I think that positioned me to, to open up opportunity that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And so I think that's kind of like be true to yourself, like no matter where you find yourself employed, yeah. um, pursue your interests and passions. I think that's the most important thing that I've done always. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, what do you look for in a potential hire? Um, we, we do a lot of work around values. Um, that's really important, just values alignment with the company. Mm -hmm. um, we look for natural curiosity, uh, a level of determination. I think, you know, the, the, again, when you're working in a business that doesn't have an automatic answer, <laughs> sometimes you have to go out and find it and be determined to find it. And so that's what works really well for us. Uh -huh. Um, I think people can show initiative in anything they've done in their student life and their personal just passion life or um, even in their community. And so we always look for that, yeah. just a, a sense of kind of passion around something. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, what do you feel like is the greatest challenge facing the fashion industry today? <laughs> I mean, kind of what we talked about yeah. before, which is like, we got to figure out how to make more with less and less harm. And I think that, you know, slowing this train of consumption and production down uh, is really hard. Consumption's gone up by 400% in the last 20 years. 400, wow. So it's, it's big. Yeah. So I think that's like huge challenge is yeah. how do we do that? Yeah. Keep, keep things in cycle longer, but make the, pro make the whole system regenerative yeah. and make the system regenerative. You know, I, I, if I'm talking purely to brands and designers, it's like start with the end in mind at the beginning. That's like a whole nother conversation about kind of design principles and like how you how you build products for longevity, durability, reusability, regeneration. That's super important, but that's gonna sit at the brand level. Yeah. Like they have to do that work because the reality is the big brands have the majority of the market share and always, I don't see that changing. So they have to, that's call to action. They've yeah. got to do that work. Yeah. They have to feel the need. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, I know there are probably some questions in the audience. Turn it over. Yes, right here. I'm going to pass my microphone to you. As a veteran of the fashion industry and very interested in the subject matter, uh, what um, I was when you were talking, what occurred to me is what happens to resale stores because you know that is what the average woman customer uh, understands, you know, and that just to, to, she feels that she's reusing the clothing and yet making some sort of a profit on it. So I think there's an incredible um, niche there for what we used to call resale stores or thrift shops. Yeah, I mean, re resale in general is obviously, a, it's a very important piece of the equation. I think there's been a lot in a great way of innovation in driving more resale into more what we would call, you know, Western markets. The reality is, and, and that's happening, and that's good news. It's definitely coming kind of online digitally, um, I would say the physical retail component probably a little less modernized at this point, but definitely digitally. The data that we see that's kind of tricky is that the quantity of product that is disposed of every year, it's about 50 billion garments in the US alone. Only about 10% of that is of quality that a Western market would buy. So when you're thinking about the total problem, that's good, but then we have to deal with the 90%. And so it's, it's definitely a facet of the solution, but it's not going to solve the problem. So we always say, you know, if you can find Poshmark, Depop, 
any of the real, real, any thread up, any of the resale platforms work for you, do that for sure. The reality is that there's so much fallout even from those that we have to catch that as well. So we think about the big bucket and how we're, how we're actually collecting, capturing, and keeping that out of landfill. Does that help? Yeah. As a greedy reseller, I will say that that is exactly what I do. I sell, <laughs> I sell the stuff I can sell, I trade the stuff I can trade, and then I have yep. sent you guys the stuff yep. that I can't do anything else with. Yep. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, there are microphones. Okay, yeah, actually, if people want to step up to that, thank you. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is for that last piece before, you know, it goes to a landfill or even those like corner, you know, drop off boxes, what are ways that we can stop that or like kind of move in that direction of that feels like it's whole own industry in a sense of slowing that down or allowing that to, you know, go to new places or be regenerated. So just any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, that's where it's like figuring out how people process product is a pretty difficult question to ask. So quickest answer, just get a bunch of take back bags. <laughs> We've got you. Um, I think if you, you kind of have to dig pretty deep beneath the surface. The information isn't highly available. So it's actually a difficult problem to solve. There's not a lot of traceability around it. Um, you kind of just have to ask the question and see where do you process? Do you sort domestically? It's the first question to ask. Um, how do you resell? Do you do any recycling? Do you do any regeneration? I think um, as individual consumers, definitely get just getting it into the right hands is, is the best thing you can do. Awesome, thank you. Let's have a question. Microphone here or here, you don't have to step very far. Anyone else out there? Oh, yeah. Hi, I am an FIT alumni. My, uh, my background was actually textile technology at the time. I worked in the industry for many years, loved it. But like you, one day I realized something was going wrong. You know, when they, I used to design luxury menswear fabrics and they weren't buying those anymore because people were going to China and they were buying it because it was cheaper, but the minimums were huge. Yep. And I remember it like it was yesterday that I sat down and I thought, wait, no one can wear that many suits. Exactly. It's like, what's gonna happen to all this stuff? <laughs> and in my, young mind, I thought, oh, this is never going to last. I'm like, it's never going to last because people are going, the companies are going to lose money. I'm like, because they're going to have so much stuff left over that it's never going to last. You know, fast forward <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> 20 yeah. years later yeah. and it's, I was right in one way, you know, but so wrong in another way because all of a sudden it's like what I what I did before is obsolete. Things are just getting copied. There's a lot of stuff that goes to waste. And it's, it's almost overwhelming, you know? So um, in the interim, I've done a lot of things, but I started a podcast called Stylishly Sustainable, where I speak about the sustainable, the sustainable brands, the young brands. Because I think what happens a lot of times is that consumers don't know the options they feel like they only know the big brands. They don't know about the small brands. And I think that's important. So what do you think is another way of educating consumers in understanding that there are other um, resources that they, can, that they can actually use? Yeah, I mean, thank you for doing that. I think that's a big, a big piece of it. It's like, where do you find the information? How is it easy to consume? How is it understandable? Um, there's no standard, so it's not like this is good, that's bad, this is organic, that's not. So that's, I mean, materials, yes, but you know, the equivalent in food. So it's, it is a really tricky thing. Um, there are some pure information players that are trying to kind of bring brand information together and give a little bit more of a standard on, okay, this is what this company does well, this is what this company does well. There's a, there's a thing called good on you. That's actually, I think, pretty good. 
at doing this? Yeah. And so I think it's, we need to get more vocal about those resources. I think it's still tough though, because it's like asking the consumer to do all the work. Um, and so that's a hard, hard thing. And then sometimes too, the smaller brands, like you don't know, is it going to fit me? Is it going to be nice? Like, and it's, it's a, it's a hard journey, I think. Um, and it's a, a mix of finding information, having vetted and kind of trusted social validation, um, and looking to those resources who I think are doing it in a more standardized way. I appreciate that because at least I feel like I'm getting a comp. Um, and I think it's all those channels together. It's the best we can do. But that's what we've tried to do with our marketplace is bring things together where we feel like this is a great product, this is a great material, this is a great story, like you can trust it. Um, but even then, it, you know, we're competing against like all the other marketing messages out there for those products. And it's a busy, busy landscape, so. Other questions out there? Can't really see everywhere, so. Yep. Hi. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name's Anastasia. I am an adjunct professor here and also founder of a sustainable swimwear brand called Crescent Blue. I really appreciate the last comment or question um, and also your response because I, I too sort of think about how does a small brand find that voice where I, I appreciated the point in your interview where you said um, sustainability can't be this like we're a company that does this this and we have this sustainable component over here um, I, I also worked in the fast uh, fashion industry for over 20 years and became you know <laughs> a little um, uh, what do you say disenchanted with what was mm -hmm. going on and when I launched my brand it wasn't um, a compartmentalized, I want to start a swimwear brand, and also here's the sustainable part. It was the idea where it had to be, you know, part and parcel with it. It was the whole basis of it. Um, but I sort of find out, like, what, I guess my question or comment is sort of like, how do you, what advice would you give to a small brand? I'm three years old. <laughs> um, how to get those messages apart, um, get those messages over to the public about the quality um, without sort of, I guess, sort of like having it be uh, an ingrained value of the product, that this is what we stand for, and sort of like um, educating the, the public that, you know, this, these are the benefits to having a sustainable product or, you know, having accountability to the environment what what are some of your <laughs> yes well first congratulations Thank because you. it's really hard mm -hmm. starting something Incredibly. that way <laughs> and independently it's really difficult <laughs> so congratulations on that i mean Thank i think you. as far as the communication goes and how you win people over particularly when you are independent and you're new i always say find your pe like try and find your people mm -hmm get them to help you tell stories. And it sounds obvious, but it's the more people talking with the same language. You can't solve all the problems of the industry. Right. So pick the ones that you're focused on. Um, you know, having an amazing product is always going to be essential. If that product can serve a specific community in a specific way, in a specific, that's the hard part about this, truthfully, right? Is like right. you still have to have this incredible product that has incredible design, that has a unique selling proposition just because it's cool or well-fitting or beautiful or, you know, you have to do all of that that everybody else has to do and do the rest differently. Mm -hmm. It's hard. So find your people, I would say, and don't worry about spreading the word to everybody all at once. Right. That's impossible and way too expensive. Um, find some fans, find some people, speak to them, engage them, get them to speak to people and engage people. And it's kind of a, a really organic way of doing it, but I think you'll find fans for life. Mm -hmm. um, we've actually, in a weird way, done that with our Take Back bag. Um, everything, if you go into like our Instagram or anything that we do is all community-led content. Like our um, head of social is not here 
for this event this week because she's doing a West Coast tour. Mm -hmm. But we do that like with a van and a location and some coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we just have people come <laughs> and we hang out and we collect stuff and we, you know, and it's fun. And um, that's been more successful than any money I could throw at some huge marketing campaign. So um, it can be hard, but keep just keep finding your people. Thank you so much. Yeah, good job. It actually, just jogged me to ask you yeah. another question. Are, is, do you have any plans down the road to have a little bit more scale in what you'll take back? Because obviously the bags are great, but they're only, you know, so yay big. big. Yay yeah, big. exactly. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we want to be the collector of everything. Um, that's a big lofty goal, yeah. so we'll see. Uh, we have to still build what works and what works financially. But, you know, if we can think about physical locations, if yeah. we can think about drop off, um, filling containers. And yeah, <laughs> except, but better, you yeah. know, and then other verticals, like we talk about, could we partner with somebody for furniture that we'll never process? But, you know, I think this idea that your whole, like, think about the end at the beginning is like a mantra. Um, but we have to, to find solutions for those things. Yeah. yeah. I like that. That's a good mantra. Think about yeah. the end at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, unless we have any more dying questions. So, oh, yes, we do. One more, maybe. Um, my name is Helene. I'm an executive coach, and I'm very interested in mindset change. And I understood that that's mm -hmm. exactly what we are all caring for. What is your practical advice? How did you support family and friends around you in, you know, daily life? We're busy. We, your children need new clothes, and you find yourself at H&M again. How did you go about the practical factor of that? Personally, um, within community, uh, it's kind of, I mean, it's a little bit what we talked about before, which is like every choice, be thoughtful. Um, I think as a, and that's individual, you know, start looking at care labels and origin labels. And in the same way, like when you have a young child, you don't want them to eat crappy food. Think about what they put on their skin. And then you think about it yourself and you're like, oh, I don't want to get poisoned by that weird fabric either. Um, so it's that you work into. I think influencing um, influencing your immediate surroundings is something you can do every day. Uh, as a company, what we've tried to do to influence behavioral change is actually lean into where people have the greatest need and the greatest joy. And so there's this element of sustainability not being a downer, where it's always like doom and gloom and like hard and expensive and wow, it's mm -hmm. tough and I need to make my own toothpaste now. It's like, I don't right. wanna do that, <laughs> right? And so how do we get it into this like positive fun zone? Um, and that's what really we do as a company. Um, we say this is a fun, joyful, engaging, easy, rewarding, all the fun things. And there's this journey of joy because you do the right thing, you put some money into doing the right thing, you buy the bag, you fill it up, you bring it back, and then you get your money back, which is like kind of a cheat. And mm -hmm. you're like, wait, I got it back. That's cool, but I still feel great. And now I can go buy some. So we just try and create these opportunities for actual ease, joy, convenience, value. Right. Um, because if it's too hard, people don't love it. Yeah, the reward <laughs> circuit. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And That's sometimes clear. people think like, oh, it's rewards, it's incentives, like it actually has to work for the system. It can't just be kind of gratuitous. If I give you more money, you'll do more. It's not true. Right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you so much. Right. Loved having you here and yeah. helping yeah. us kick off our great week here. Right. Um, all of you, just so you know, Faces and Places meets every single week, Monday nights, 4 o'clock, different industry professionals come in a lot of them sustainably focused. So we'd love to have you back again for another class. And I'll pass it back to Karen to end our Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And Christy, thank you. And you mentioned my most favorite statistic, which just makes me happy. That yes, if you are willing to wear an article of clothing just three to four more times, you can reduce the carbon footprint of that article of clothing between 40 and 60%. So please, don't be afraid to wear it again. Nobody will notice. Um, but thank you so much for talking and sharing your story and sharing how we can really grow a brand where we can look at solving a problem and do so with a mindset that is joyful. I think 
as we start to make change, thinking about the fact that making impact by itself is really a joyful thing and some of those impacts are not big, you are correct, we cannot all change the world every step of the way, but we can all make a great impact by making a series of small collective changes towards our future, which hopefully will be much more sustainable than our current moment. So Christy, thank you so much for coming and spending some time with you. And now I believe I saw up at the far back end that there may be a couple more questions. So afterwards, please don't hesitate to come down and ask a couple questions. In addition, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you, our alumni, our faculty, our students, to our Sustainability Awareness Week opening reception and networking event. You may leave your coats in these chairs and you will find refreshments around the back behind the stage. If you exit from the top, you can use the stairs to come down. So again, thank you. And again, thank you to Caroline and to Christy for being part of it. And thank you to all of you for coming. We hope you'll attend the remainder of the events throughout the week in addition to the networking reception. So please join us in our alumni networking reception following this.